Good morning. Still morning. <laughs> One more minute. Yeah, it's a joy. It's a joy to be back uh, with you. Uh, it's been here a few times, so it's a joy. And thanks, Pastor Tiak, for this kind invitation. Um, this morning, I was like so glad to be here this morning. But then when I heard the announcement, uh, I wish you had invited me next Sunday. Because next Sunday, got satay, got, got ice kacang and all that, right? But I like that idea, you know, you link that like, topic to Mai Kan Chiong, right? It flows. The Lord will provide. So, Mai Kan Chiong. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, in fact, we just had a drink together uh, just now in between service. It's just good to care. But I do meet Pastor Tiang uh, practically once a month for our Bali Family of Churches Senior Pastors core team. It's always a, a safe place for us. It's a safe place for us, uh, four brothers. Uh, we share quite openly. We talk about ministry. And we share, pray for each other. We tell things that you will never understand. Anna. You will never understand what Pastor Tia has to face. You know, and It's not your fault. Even if I explain to you, you also cannot understand. This is my, what my wife tells me all the time. <laughs> you don't understand. I explain to you, so no use. Uh, so it's good to, to gather you know, among brothers and uh, it, I always look forward to it. We have no agenda. We come, we take turns to host and just catch up, you know. We can talk about anything. But of course, two favourite topics would be family, something close to our heart, and inevitably ministry, something very close to our heart as well. So this morning, I'd like to share with you a message from Genesis 22, which is story of uh, Abraham called by God to do something that is just unimaginably difficult, which is to sacrifice his son. And i like to... Um, yeah, okay, but bef- we, we, we'll read the passage in a moment. But, you know, f- especially for Chinese, I, th- I see many of us are Chinese here or Asians, we, we believe in this thing called... Uh, Jomancy, right? Or Feng Shui, right? Where the, the way you position your building, your furniture, even your door is very important. I never knew this, you know. First time I saw, I think it was Higher Hotel. This was, I'm not sure where it's, whether it's still the same. The front door was a bit slanted. And I thought it's just an artistic thing. Then I realized later that, no, 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 this is a Feng Shui thing, you know. And there's a belief that if you position yourself in a certain way, correctly, you catch the the flow, you catch the, the feng shui, the right feng shui, and then uh, provision will come, right? Blessing will come. Prosperity will come. And deep in our hearts, all of us want that. I mean, we all need that, the truth be told. But as believers in the Lord, we know of a better way to do it. Amen? We know of one way that is shown to us by God. And we will look at the story of... Uh, Abraham and Isaac, and to see how we can position ourselves so that we can receive God's blessing. And just to put up a statement there for a start, it says here, posture determines position and progress. Posture is very important, and I'm not talking about physical posture. I'm talking about the posture of the heart. This is not a physical thing, all right? This is not even how we pray. You know, our Muslim friends and Jewish friends, when they pray, they would face east. Or they would face Jerusalem, rather. Or Mecca. Even if they're on the aeroplane. That's what I understand. So there's this belief that how, how we position ourselves, where we face is very important. And I think this is a concept that we believe as Christians as well. But of course, how we do it is a little bit different. So posture determines position and progress. And the question i like to, for us to, Think about, and I'd like to share a few thoughts from this passage, is how to posture ourselves so that we can receive God's provision. You ready for that? Okay, let's start off by reading a passage of Scripture from Genesis 22. Uh, We'll read from verse 1 to 14, but I'm going to cover a few more verses beyond that. Would you stand with me? Let's read it together in full voice. Full voice means, all right, we can hear each other. You don't have to scream and shout, all right? Uh, By the way, this is a good practice uh, because actually 
what I'm doing now is, is, is not to teach the Word per se. It's, a, it's called the proclamation of the Word, where I proclaim to you what the Bible says. Amen? All right? Of course, I have to work hard lah, to make sure that whatever I say is from the Bible, okay? Not my own uh, human wisdom. So when we read God's Word out loud, we're actually proclaiming the Word. Uh, my practice is I love to spend a few minutes to read through the passage that we, for our meditation. And I can assure you that uh, every word that we read from the Bible is not wasted. I can't say the same thing for what I'm going to say next. <laughs> but let's read verse 1 to 14 together in full voice. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 6. Verse 8. Verse 14, And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Amen. Thank you. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. I'd like to show you a statement which really summarizes all I'm going to say for the next maybe half an hour or so. And it's called, uh, the statement goes like this, A posture of availability positions us to receive God's provision for ourselves and others. A posture of availability, when we posture our hearts such that we are available to God to say yes, to, to say, take my life, to, to be willing to surrender to anything that God would ask, that posture uh, will position us to receive God's provision for ourselves and others. So it's a posture of the heart. It's not a physical posture. It's not how we arrange our furnitures or our doors and windows. It is not our own clever ideas. doesn't mean we don't have to work hard. But the posture of our hearts and a posture of avail availability position us to receive God's provision for ourselves and for others. And I'll come to that point in a moment. That's the exciting part. So, how do we posture ourselves? What is the key to receive God's provision? All of us here want God's provision, right? And it can be anything. We're not just talking about money. Suddenly, there's one item on the list. It could be for our children. It could be for our career, our business, our studies, anything. We look to our God, who is our provider. We sang the song earlier, He's our Father, and He's our provider. And that's correct, absolutely right. But the key is how do we then position ourselves so that we can receive God's provision? 
abundantly, bountifully, not just enough, but free-flowing for ourselves and for others. And I'd like to share with you the key to how to position ourselves in order to receive God's provision. You want that? <laughs> I'm sure you do. And the key here is based on this word called here I am. And we will look at this word a bit. Ah, okay, it's up there. Here I am. Uh, this is a word that is used in the Bible many times. Here I am is used, uh, in fact, almost 200 times, 178 times in the Old Testament. In this passage alone, is used three times. And I'm going to basically unpack these three times how this word is used in this passage. And from there, you will learn the key from the Bible, how to position ourselves in order to receive God's blessing. So let's look at first Abraham's first here I am in the first four verses. Next slide. Okay. Now it came to pass, verse 1, after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said what? Here I am. All right. So basically, I'm going to just unpack this story and show you the principles. So it says here that after these things, it came to pass after these things. What is these things? Well, after all, we read the first few chapters. Abraham came into the picture from chapter 12, and you'll find him going through a lot of very exciting times. And there were many promises and blessings that God gave Abraham. And in fact, in total, there are 14 blessings. And this is the 14th. This is the last and the most important. And it's actually built on the other blessings and promises that God actually gave Abraham. So he come to this point, he said, it came to pass after these things. What did God do? God tested Abraham. He said, wow, God tests us. Yes, God tests us. But God doesn't tempt us. There's a difference between being tempted and being tested. The devil will tempt us to show us our weaknesses, to reveal our weaknesses and to discourage and destroy us. But God will test us to also reveal what is inside of us so that we can take a good look at ourselves. And of course, the whole idea is so that we say, oh, you know what? There are some growth areas I need to work on. It is so that we can be built up. It is so that we can be encouraged. So God tests us to strengthen us ultimately. The devil tempts us uh, to destroy us. So God tested Abraham. And what is this test? This is an unbelievable test. It says, Abraham. And then he said, here I am. And maybe you could be in a place when God is testing you. You're going through a very difficult time. It could be any area of your life. And God is actually testing you. Now, we need wisdom, of course. Is this from the Lord or is this from the devil? If this is from the devil, then we will have to respond correctly. We have to reject what the devil says, all right? We have to, we have to exercise spiritual warfare. Recently, um, there was this ministry. You might have heard of it, uh, the Burning Hearts Ministry, because I'm one of their spiritual advisor. So just in May, Burning Hearts uh, went on a 21 days uh, fast, uh, fast and prayer for the nation of Israel. And it's 21 days, 24-7. How many of you ever heard of that? Okay, a couple of you, right? Yeah. Okay, I know it's, some of you might have heard of it. I mean, we even went there. So anyway, I, I participated. And what was interesting was this. I think about a week before it actually started, the, the staff team and the volunteers had a meeting together, about 40 plus, 50 of them, uh, just to commit to the Lord and some, some basic instructions and briefing. And then there was a group of young people came, young adults, maybe around your age, came in, sat there, sat through the whole thing. And then one of them actually stood up in the midst of the meeting and started uh, basically condemning the whole initiative basically said that this is not of the Lord, you're being presumptuous and blah, 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 and you must stop it. If you don't do it, something bad is going to happen to, to your ministry. And I wasn't there. I couldn't make it, but I heard about it later. So a couple of days later, they had a Zoom call just to process this whole thing. So I was, because I'm a spiritual advisor, I was asked to join. And I listened to what happened, uh, and they were trying to process it. And I still remember one of them very humbly said, you know, uh, yeah, we need to reflect. 
maybe what the guy say is true, there's some truth, you know, we, we, we are missing something, and so on and so forth. Halfway through, I, I cannot tahan really. I stop here, I say, brother, do you mind if I say something, okay? So on the Zoom, I chip in. I said, this is clearly not from God, all right? This is from the devil. This guy's words, even if I hear secondhand, is a words of condemnation and judgment. And you could see that they were all quite shaken, all right? They were very discouraged. I said, this is not from the Lord. And if it's from the devil, you just need to reject it. Don't bother. If the devil tells you something, you don't go and say, you know, maybe the devil got a point, you know. You know, I mean, I know that guy is not very nice, huh? but if he has a point, I must be open to listen, right? No! <laughs> if it's from the devil, you reject it. Even if he has, quote, unquote, a point, he will twist it in such a way to discourage. So we do need wisdom, okay? We do need wisdom. Okay, how we do it, that's another sermon for another time. But if you discern that this is from the Lord, it's a testing, then it is a very different story. And if you're in a season where God is testing you, I believe God wants to strengthen you. I believe God wants to position you so that, like Abraham, you can be a channel of His blessing, not just for yourself, but also for other people as well. So the word here is Hineni. So when Abraham was tested, his response is, here I am, when God called out to him. And uh, the Hebrew word is Hineni. Now, here I am is not talking about a physical position. You know, just like on, on my way here, I, I have to text Caroline, I'm going to be late and all that. Now, when I arrive, here I am, okay? If you ask, hey, Pastor Vincent, where are you? Oh, I'm in this coffee shop, here I am. That's telling you where I am, right? But this is not a physical location. This is a posture of the heart. And it's a posture of complete availability. Maybe in the army, you say, yes, sir. <laughs> you know? But your mouth say yes, sir, but your heart is like, this guy rascal, you know, like uh, beat him up and all that, you know. But no, this is not just what you say in the mouth, but fully in your heart, you say, Lord, here I am, Hineni. It is, it is a posture of availability. And you see here, God is asking Abraham to do something that is unimaginably difficult. He's asking him to sacrifice his son, his only son. By the way, he got more than one son, right? He, actually, Ishmael is his son. But God never recognized Ishmael as a unique son. Only Isaac was chosen, and he's a unique son. So here, only is, also means unique. Isaac is, a, is, the, is the son of faith that God gave to Abraham and Sarah. So, but he's asking him to do something that is, it doesn't make sense. He asked him to kill someone. This is the only time in the Old Testament that God demanded for someone to be sacrificed. A human sacrifice. Okay, this is the only time. Now, I know there could be, there can be a separate theological discussion. Can God even do that? I thought He commanded us not to kill, right? But here He actually asked Abraham to kill Isaac. There's another time God demanded a human sacrifice. Do you know where that is? 2,000 years later, on the same spot, Mount Moriah, our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine. And this time, it was God who gave His only begotten Son. I'll come back to this point in a moment. So, suffice to say here is that I can, Abraham, must, there's so much going through his mind. What is going on? You know, this is my, the promised son that God gave me. This Isaac, I love him very much. And by the way, by then, uh, Isaac is he's already an adult. Okay? He wasn't a child. He was really a full-grown adult. And so much hope was put in him. Everything that God, he has been hearing from God that you're going to be a blessing and so on and so forth. All that hope, he put it on this son. And he's like, you know, we are making it. He's growing up. He's growing up to be a fine young man. And then suddenly God says, I want you to bring him to the mountain of Moriah and sacrifice him. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? But the Bible doesn't give us the details. All it tells us that Abraham heard it from the Lord. And it's not the first time he heard from God, Right? I mean, right in Genesis 12, when God called Abraham, I want you to leave your country. I want you to go somewhere. I'm going to show you. doesn't even tell him where, you know. Just that you take the first step first, all right? Then from there, I'll show you. Finally, he ended up, of course, in the promised land. Uh, then going there immediately, but only many generations later. We see also here that Abraham and Isaac is a type of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, 
See, this language reminds us very much of, uh, of, of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is verse 2 already. Yeah. And go to the land of Moriah. Where is this? This is a mountain. Today, if you go to Israel, it's called the Temple Mount, all right? If you visited Israel. But Moriah actually is, is more like a ridge. It's not just one spot. In fact, that's not even the highest spot, okay? So, it's, it's quite a big area, but the spot that Temple Mount now is uh, Moriah, it's, it's, it's called Temple Mount, and that is kind of traditionally believed to be the place that Abraham is supposed to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, but on the very spot that uh, it is believed is where Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac, it's now the Doom of the Rock. You have seen pictures of that, right? Now you cannot enter the Doom of the Rock. But years ago, I visited Israel. It was still open to the public. I actually went there, and right in the middle of that, that doom, which is, not, which is actually a, 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 what do you call that? It's not, it's not a mosque. It's a um, shrine. Is it something like that? Okay, it's not a mosque. Uh, and it's just a piece of rock on the ground. Okay? I remember going there many years ago. I looked at that piece of rock. I said, we can go to Third World War because of this <laughs> piece of rock. Okay? Because it is believed by uh, Jews and, and Muslims and many Christians too that that's a very spot that God asked to sacrifice, asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Anyway, let me move on. And you have to offer him there as a burning, burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So it's a big place. So it's one of the spots. So Abraham rose early. You see, when you have a posture of availability to God, of complete submission to Him, you will respond quickly. You will not delay, all right? The only delay is if you're not sure if this is from Lord, the Lord and you need time to discern and pray and so on. But once you are sure or you're sufficiently sure it's from God, you do not delay, you obey. And then he says, uh, he rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his men. It reminds us of Jesus uh, having two men, one on his left and right with him offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. So it was three days from Beersheba, which is the southern part of Judea. Uh, if you go to Israel, the, now it's called the West Bank. It's the, traditionally, it's the heartland of, uh, biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria. And Beersheba is more to the south. And it takes him three days on foot with donkeys to move up, all right, north rather, to, uh, to Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem. And say, on the third day, and the third day reminds us of Jesus died and resurrected on the third day. So on the way there, it is as if Abraham already counted Isaac as dead. Because God asked him, I want you to go there and sacrifice your son. He rose up early and he was walking there. He was doing what? He was preparing to kill his son. Now, I'm sure a thousand questions went through his mind, right? What is happening? What am I doing? This is absolutely crazy. How am I going to explain to my wife <laughs> when I come back later, okay? So, I'm sure that was all going through his mind, but he went up there. Okay, my point here is simply this. Abraham was willing to say, here I am. A posture of complete availability to the Lord. And Abraham is Abraham that we know today, the father of nations, our spiritual forefather, because Abraham was willing to say, here I am. Let's look at the second here I am, all right? Moving from verse 5. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey and the lad and I will go yonder and worship. So the two young men followed him. Last stretch, you stay here. Only he and Isaac went up. Stay here and worship. By the way, it's the first time the word worship is used in the Bible. In fact, this passage has a lot of firsts. Huh? And then the next phrase, very interesting. We will come back to you. Now, Abraham, there are two guys, you stay here, you come far enough. The last stretch, only Isaac and me. And he told them, we will come back to you. Now, what's going on in Abraham's mind? I'm going to bring Isaac up. I'm going to sacrifice him as a burnt offering to the Lord because that's what God tells me, okay? But he told these two young men that we will come back, not just him. We will come back. That means Abraham was very sure 
that Isaac will follow him back. He doesn't know how it's going to work. He's not sure. But we read later in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, that by faith Abraham, when he was tested, you see, he was referring to Genesis 22, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in fact, uh, was in the act of offering up his only son. God emphasized, I want you to, to, to sacrifice your son, and only son, that means this unique son. Ishmael is not quite counted. Only Isaac, right? This is the one. And that um, uh, verse 18, Hebrews 11, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offsprings be made. I know this is your promised son. I know all the promises is going to go through him, but I want you to sacrifice. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So Hebrews, look back what happened 2,000 years ago, and the writer of Hebrews said that Abraham was willing to sacrifice, but he has such faith in God that even if he kills Isaac, God can raise him from the dead. Now again, reminds us of Jesus, right? Was killed, died, and was raised from the dead. But all this, Abraham doesn't quite... Now we look back, we know. Now we have the story of Jesus, we know. But Abraham didn't know. So it took great faith for him. And he was willing to be available. In verse 8, if, uh, let me move on, uh, verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham. They were walking up, last stretch, right? Uh, he, and said to his father and said, My father... And he said, here I am. So Abraham and Isaac were going up Mount Moriah. Okay, actually it's, it's a hill. Jerusalem is, is set on a hill. So you, whenever you read in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's always go up to Jerusalem. You can be coming from the north, south, east and west. It's always up because it's go up, right? I look up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and the earth. You can be coming up from the south, but it's still going up. So as they were going up, and you can imagine what's going on in Abraham's mind. This is crazy. What am I doing? You know, I kiss you already. How am I going to explain to my wife? And yet when the son called him father, Abraham responded immediately the same word. Here I am, my son. I'm available, my son. Whatever is your question, my son. You know, there's a good lesson there. You know? When we are available to God, we become available to other people around us. Let, let me say that again. When we are available to God, we become available to people around us. Have you ever talked to people where he's sitting in front of you, but you know he's not listening? Okay, worse still, this guy is typing away in his handphone, like some of you are doing now. Oops. No, but you're checking your Bible, right? I know, I'm checking Bible, so it's okay. <laughs> but I have no idea. No? And you talk to somebody, like he may be looking at you and nodding his head, but he's not listening. Because mo next moment he asks a question, you know that this guy did not listen at all. Okay? Some of you say you're talking about my husband <laughs> or my wife for that matter. Okay? So, but a person who is available to God, a person who has a posture of, here I am, Lord, I'm completely available to you. I'm here to serve you, whatever you say. With that posture, you become available to people around us. That's a beautiful thing. So Abraham, although he was under tremendous pressure probably a lot of things going through his mind, yet when his son said, Father, call him Father, my Father, he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, Isaac said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. You know, Isaac was asking a question about worship. He was asking a theological question. I, I see the fire, I see the wood, but I don't see the lamb. And Abraham was able to answer. If you are available to God, you are available to your children. It was a teachable moment for Isaac and Abraham was there to be able to give a good answer. God will provide. Because it basically means you become less, less self-centered and become more available first to God than to one another. Okay, let's look at the third, here I am. And this is found from verse 10 onwards. Let's read on. Verse 10. And Abraham, okay, come to this point, Ab already the wood, everything, and put Isaac. And by the way, interesting side note, uh, Isaac is already a grown man. 
So the fact that Abraham was able to tie him up and put him on the altar, it means that Isaac also believed. If not, he could have fought his way out. Right? So when God told him, I mean, we don't have this detailed, that uh, Abraham told him, my son, God will provide himself the lamb, Isaac somehow went along. Alright, I'm speculating a little bit because we don't have the details, but it's not too far-fetched to say that Isaac actually went along. And he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay him. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said what? Abraham, Abraham. And what was Abraham's response in verse 11? So he said what? One more time, what did he say? Here I am. Again, imagine the tremendous pressure Abraham was on. He was like, I'm just, I'm going to kill my son. This is absolutely nuts. What am I doing? But God told me to do it. I'm going to do it. And yet, with all that pressure he was going through, when God called out to him, angel of the Lord called out to him, he heard God's voice and he re- responded straight away. So you see, a posture of availability to God also means that you will hear God's voice. Can I have an amen for that? So I give you I just gave you a a seminar on how to hear God's voice in two minutes. No need to attend a six-hour seminar. No, but attend. Okay, it's still good for you. (laughs) But let me give you the gist of it, okay? If you are attentive to God, if you, throughout the day, not just when you're in church, throughout the day, you're taking your MLT, you're going about your business, you are, your studies or whatever, home, chores, parenting, children's needs, and so on and so forth, your ministry, if you have a posture of being available to God, a posture of here I am, you are, you are responsive to people's needs around you, but you also hear God's voice. If you want the key how to hear God's voice, have a posture of here I am. The fact is that God is always speaking, just that we don't hear Him because we are so distracted, right? So developing this posture of here I am is very important. And you say, how do I develop this posture? Well, it, it, it takes steps. It's layer by layer. It starts with small things. A willingness to trust God. A willingness to surrender. A willingness to say, here is my Isaac. And this Isaac can be different, from different for different people. And by the way, it's not something you learn overnight. It's something that you grow as you stretch your spiritual muscles. For some of you, the Isaac could be finance. For Abraham, finance is not the issue. If God has asked Abraham, I want you to sacrifice all your sheep and lamb. I want you to give up all your money and all that. Abraham will say, no problem, done. I'll just talk to my accountant and it's all settled. (laughs) But that's not what God wants from Abraham. I want your son, your only son, Isaac your promised son, not any other son. But for some of you, it may not be finance. For some of you, it could be your children. Some of you, it's your studies. It could be a relationship. Could there be a relationship God wants you to sacrifice on the altar? Because it's not good for you. It's not meant for you. Are you willing to say, Lord, I'll put it on the, off- on the altar as a burnt offering? I don't mean you literally take that guy and burn him up in your spirit. For me, I tell you, I can trust God for many things quite easily, but there's one area that I have to work hard over the years is trusting God for finance. It may seem strange to you because when God called me to come in full-time with Bartley Church, this was, I was in my 20s, that was a long time ago, mid-80s, I was already a qualified accountant, right? I mean, qualified accountant can make a decent living, all right? Not too bad. And <clears throat> the Lord called. Of course, I prayed about it, talked to people and so on. And finally, I, when I realized, okay, I, I think this, God, this is from God. It wasn't difficult for me to give up my accountant job. It wasn't difficult for me to give up the prestige, go work in the church. Somehow that didn't bother me. At that time, the only thing that that was difficult was to explain to my parents. But thank God my parents were quite understanding, so we got past that. But it was very interesting because over the years, I didn't realize it, that when it comes to finance, I get more anxious more easily. And I remember uh, 
I mean, I was in River Life for many years. It was a much bigger church. My current church is a lot smaller, lah, okay? So resources, not as much. But River Life, a lot of resources. There's no reason for me to worry about finance. But you know, it's interesting because very often our leadership meeting or staff meeting, right? Sometimes my staff will be so worried about certain things, you know? Christmas is coming up. Don't know how many people will come. Ayo, our cell's not moving, blah, blah. I say, relax, ah, why are you? My kanchong. <laughs> my kanchong lah, okay one, you know? But they're all worried, you know? But when it comes to finance, right, raising funds for building and all that, I find that I was more worried. But logically, it doesn't make sense because by then, the church was quite stable, actually with quite healthy reserve. But somehow, I worry more. Okay, I, I realized over time uh, that I have a bit of poverty mentality. And it's got to do with my childhood, my upbringing, you know, uh, growing up in Malaysia, we didn't have a lot. So my parents instilled in me this fear of not enough. Fear of not enough. And in our initial years, yes. But over time, my parents did very well. But till today, <laughs> mom, sorry. Uh. <laughs> my mom still had poverty mentality. I just talked to her recently only. You know, why are you so worried? You know, you have more than enough to last you three lifetimes. Uh. Why are you so worried? You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this to criticize my mom. My, my point, but she's a Christian already, okay? So I think she's growing. So for me, it was something, my Isaac, so to speak, in this case, is trusting God for finances, to be willing to surrender to the Lord, okay? Uh, not just in terms of giving, but just in my heart to say, let's be willing. And it affects me because it affects my decision making, whether it's my own life or ministry, right? But I thank God I have other leaders who dare to trust God more for finances. Pastor, don't worry, just trust God. After that, I'm the one who have to raise funds. Eh? <laughs> no, like, just kidding, just kidding. But because I realize it, Many years ago, I started to work on it. I started to, to stretch. Okay, what I'm trying to tell you is how you can develop your muscles. I started to, okay, trust God. Just take a step. Eh, it worked. Eh, it's not so bad. And the next round, I find that I can trust God a bit easier, a bit easier. So over time, I think by and large, I've overcome the poverty mentality. I don't worry about finance so much anymore. I mean, you still need to be wise and good stewards and all that, but I don't worry as much as I used to. For you, it could be something else, alright? It could be relationship. It could be, you know, I'm coming of age, I need to get married. <laughs> it's a good thing. My daughter is getting married end of the year, praise God, you know. <laughs> Finally, we found a man worthy of my daughter. Worthy, okay. Okay, never mind. So, <laughs> It could be anything. And I, I don't mean to make light of it. It could be something heavy on your heart. It could be something important to you. And God knows that. The question is, are you willing to say, here I am, Lord? And you may have to start with the simpler things. Because that's what happened to Abraham. It was testing after testing after testing. You just read from 12 to 22. This is Abraham's final and supreme test. Because God is preparing Abraham to be the father of multitude of nations. And God wants to know, Abraham, can you take the responsibility? Are you willing? And God has shown him stars in the sky, sands on the seashore. Wow, I've got vision now, I've got prophets come along, you know, all kind of vision, dreams and all that. But it comes down to something <laughs> a lot more <laughs> close to his heart your son, your only son, whom you love, will you trust me enough to put him on that altar as a burnt offering unto me? Abraham said, here I am. So here again, angel of the Lord spoke to him. He responded straight away. A posture of here I am, you become attentive also to God. You respond to God. You hear God's voice a lot better. And then we finally end with verse 14. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. As Abraham called. Okay, so in between, we know what happened. The angel stopped him and said, look, there's a ram. By the way, it's a ram is, is a male sheep, okay? There's a ram caught in the ticket. So instead of Isaac, you, that ram is the one that you will use for sacrifice. And then Abraham called the name of the place. The Lord will provide. 
as it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be provided. If you have a chance to go to Israel, you go up to Temple Mount, you say, this is the place where God says it shall be provided. Amen? And by the way, that phrase we are familiar with, it's, it's a name, God revealed His name. He's got many names. So here He revealed His name as what? You're familiar, Jehovah? Jairah, or Jehovah Jireh, or Yireh, to be more exact. You sing the song, right? Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Do you sing such song? Or is it my generation song? <laughs> Your young people say, Ayo, Uncle Vincent, the kind of song cannot make it nowadays. Okay, la, you exe, la, you. Okay, never mind. Okay, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, right? That phrase came from this verse. In fact, it's the only time it's used in the Bible. Jehovah Jireh, it means the Lord will provide. By the way, will provide. Huh? That means it's future, you know. It's not the Lord provided. The Lord is providing now. The Lord will also provide. I like that. I like that because in the past, thank you very much, but what about the future? God says, I will provide. Even if Isaac is offered his dead, I will still provide. And Abraham said that I know God can raise him from the dead. I don't know how he's going to do it. I can't explain to you, but I know God can do it. And because of that, God told him in verse 15, let me read to you. We didn't get a chance to read it. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, say the Lord, because you have done this thing. What is this thing? And have not withheld your son, your only son. Because you have a posture of here I am. Because you're willing to say, God, I'm willing. I'm available. Complete availability. God says, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. This is not a new phrase. We read it a couple of times before that. So it's a phrase that Abraham is familiar. And he already seen the vision. God has shown him, look at the stars, look at the sand on the seashore. He, he knows this image. But God says, look, the test is going to come. But before that, there's a final test for you, Abraham. You know the concept, you understand. And I know by and large, you have been trying to walk in that journey. But one more time, Abraham, I need to know do you really fear me? And to do that, I'm going to ask you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah. So it says, as the stars in the heaven, sand on the, uh, which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. Verse 18 is the exciting part. You know what verse 18 says? In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. You see, sisters and brothers, when we have a posture of availability, not only we position ourselves to receive God's blessing for ourselves, for our family, but we become a channel of blessing to other people. So Abraham did not just receive the blessing for himself, his children, his descendants. You know, wow. Multiple descendants, very good. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He became a father to the multitudes, to nations. And he became the supreme example for all of us. Yeah, worship team, you can make your way up here. So let me go back to this statement again. A posture, maybe read it together with me. A posture of availability positions us to receive God's provision for ourselves and others. What is the Isaac God is asking you to sacrifice on the altar this, this afternoon, this Sunday? I think each one of us have our own Isaacs. It means different. For me, one area was trusting God with finances. By the way, actually, I experienced another test. I don't mind sharing with you. Last year, there was an amount I put in investment. It's a very safe investment, safe. I didn't take risk. So you cannot say, well, I took high risk and all that, okay? But something went wrong. I lost the whole amount. Now, if I tell you the amount, you say, yeah, sub, sub, sorry, small amount. But I'm a pastor. No, we don't earn very much. Eh? No, 
I stop to. So I bit sim tian lah, you know. I mean, it's okay. It doesn't affect my. Doesn't. I mean, we're still fine, but it was still like. So we kind of ask God why and all that, and process it. See, my wife has no issue trusting God for finances, partly because she can't count lah. No, she's actually very smart. Her her family background is. You know, you you ask my wife how much money you got in the bank account. She can never answer one. She doesn't know. In fact, when she was still working and she did serve in the church many years, she she always cannot remember her salary. But her family upbringing is、uh, although they are not rich, but they are very generous. They don't worry about finance, which is good. So she balanced me up. But if all of us are like that, we'll be very poor. But anyway, never mind. <laughs> But she worry about other things. She worry about things that I say. When you worry, I mean, it's like very simple. <laughs> say, I don't know. I don't understand. I know. <laughs> so she has her own Isaac. You may have yours. One last story, and you're familiar with this. Fast forward two thousand years. On that same Mount Moriah, I don't know if it's the exact same spot. It could well be, but we know at least it's. That area, Mount Moria. The same thing happened. There was a father who was asked. Actually, he asked himself to sacrifice his own son, his only son, whom he loved. This God, the Father, sacrificing his son Jesus Christ. Same mountain. So if you do a comparison of the two stories, very similar, you know, a lot of details are very similar. There's only one difference. There was no ram provided as a substitute. Show the next picture. This is my last picture to you. Jesus on the cross. This time round, this son and only son of God the Father was sacrificed. As a burnt offering for your sins and mine. If this heavenly Father is willing to give up His Son and only Son, whom He loved, for you, for me, for us, I think we can trust Him, trust His heart to provide. Would you stand with me, please?